Hello, thank you for joining our talk. My name is Raul. Here we also have uh, my colleague uh, Victor. We are both uh, software engineers at SUSE Rancher. And today we are going to talk about how to enforce a secure supply chain in Kubernetes. We took this image from the Salsa security uh, framework. Um, as you can see, attacks can happen at every link in a typical software supply chain. If we start looking at this picture from the left, first thing we need to protect is our source code. Imagine we're using some kind of a source control management system, such as Git, and our Git credentials get compromised. Someone can push uh, some malicious code, we are not aware of it. Our build uh, pipelines will eventually trigger a new build containing this malicious code. It will fetch the code alongside its dependencies. It will compile and build a container image and it will push this image to a container registry. Then in our production cluster, we will eventually pull this malicious image in production. So it's not just our source codes, everything in our supply chain we need to protect. It's our build system, it's dependencies, it's where we store our packages or container images. Imagine our container re uh, registry gets compromised and someone pushes a malicious uh, image. We don't notice that, th that this image then came from our build uh, system. Um, we, if we pull that from, in, from our production cluster, that's it. We already have some malicious code running in production. So that's what we want to avoid. If you go to the Salsa website, you will see real attacks that happen for each of these uh, points. Today, we want to focus on two of them, which happen between the build and the package phase. So the first one, it's uh, an attack that happened to CodeCop. Somehow the credentials to Google Cloud uh, got leaked and um, a malicious user managed to upload a malicious artifact to the market. Then the users downloaded this artifact and they, they were not aware it was not coming from, from the CodeCop. So how they could have prevented this from happening? by using some kind of a provenance check of, of the artifact, then they would have known that this artifact didn't came from, from, from code code. And the second one, it's an attack or that happened on package mirror. Someone started running mirrors for several popular package repositories. Um, they were used uh, by some user that they thought they were pulling from the right repository and they didn't notice. Uh, again, same as before, did they have any way to prove the provenance or the artifact? So this provenance check could have prevented this from happening. So this is what we're going to learn today, how to implement this provenance check. For that, we're going to sign our container images and then we're going to verify this signature before we deploy uh, our pods in our Kubernetes cluster. And for the signing, let me introduce uh, Sixto. Sixto is a combination of open source technologies that allow, allow us to handle signing, verification, and provenance check. We can sign almost everything. It's not just container images. It's everything that's stored in an OCI registry. It's a binary blob. It's software bill of materials and uh, many more. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, increasing adoption for Sixto in the open source community. Even Kubernetes itself start designing their own artifacts starting in version 124. So let's talk about some of the tools that comes with Sixto. Cosign. Cosign is the tool that we use for the actual signing and verification. If we are signing an artifact that's stored in an OCI registry, such as a container image, the signature will be stored as a separate object in the same OCI registry with a predictive name with it with which is the digest of this uh, image. There are two ways of signing with Sisto. We have the traditional way of Keeper, where you need a Keeper that you can bring your own if you have one, or you can generate one with a cosign. And then you need the private key alongside its uh, uh, password for signing. And then you need to distribute the public key for verification. And then we have the keyless, which doesn't involve uh, using any key at all. It's using OIDC as authentication, 
and we will see later. We actually will see examples for both of them. So let's first uh, see how we can sign using a keeper. And for that, I will create a, a new keeper with cosign. Cosign generate keeper. We need to enter a password. And we need to keep this password secure. Alongside our private key. A cosign has support from some key management systems such as Hasiko Vault, AWS, KMS, also Google Cloud. So that could help you with the key, uh, key management. Okay, so we have our keeper. Let's sign. I created a, a small project for this demo and I already pushed uh, some container images to uh, GitHub. So we will use that for, for signing. Okay, so we just need to pass the key we just created to cosign and the name of the image. We need to enter the password. And that's it. That's it. Our image is signed. As you can see here, the signature was pushed to our container registry. So let's see. Let's see that in, in GitHub. Okay, so this is the image we were signed. This is the tag we, we signed. It's actually, we, we are not signing a tag. It's always signing the manifest digest. Um, we see here the digest which manages which matches the name of the signature. So this thing is the signature that was pushed just right now. The signature lives alongside the, this in the same OCI registry. Okay, so that's it, that's how you sign. Now let's see how we can verify. For verify, same as before, we need to provide a key, but this time it's the public key. Um, the name of the container. And that's it. It was successfully verified. We see here information about the image, but we didn't see any error. That means that it was successfully verified. Okay, so this is how you sign with a keeper. But remember, you need to handle the keys. You need to store securely your private key and the password. And you need to distribute the public key for verification. If you don't have a public key, you cannot verify the signature. So before we go into the keyless mode, let, let me introduce uh, another tool, two more tools that comes with Sisto. And the first one is Fulcho. Fulcho is the root certificate authority that issues a certificate that we will use for, for signing our artifact. It issues solid certificate delivered for under 20 minutes. And it's based on an OIDC email address. OIDC or OpenID Connect is an identity layer built on top of OAuth 2. And it allows third party application to verify the identity of an end user. So the way it works is we request a certificate to Fulcio. We authenticate at, with one of our of the OIDC provider. We pass this uh, OIDC token to Fulcio. Fulcio will give us some uh, short lead certificates and it will publish the certificate to a, a transparency log. And there is a, a public instance available hosted by the Sisto community, but still experimental at, at this moment. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the record or the transparency log. Record is an immutable uh, ledger of metadata. That means that you can append new record, but you cannot modify or delete any existing record. It provides a RESTful API for querying the data, so you can use it for validation. There is also the record CLI available. That the same, you can query, you can query the the transparency log. Um, same as Fulcho, there is a public instance available, but it's still experimental. Same as with a Fulcho, you can run your own instance if, if you want. That's totally fine. Okay, so let's put everything together and see how the keyless, so see how we can sign using the keyless mode. So keyless uses OIDC for identity. So that's it. We don't need, we don't need key. We just need an authentication from, from an OIDC provider. That's all we need to prove our identity. 
Then we will use the, the shortlist certificate issued by Fulcio for the actual signing. And we will push these certificates alongside the signature to the record transparency log. And that's how we verify. We verify the record transparency log with, with also the timestamp. And then we can know if a signature, we can trust it or not. It also has support for automated environment for CI, CD pipelines, as we, we will see an example of that uh, later. I know this KS mode can be a bit confusing at the beginning, so let me explain it with this uh, diagram, which hopefully will help you to understand better how, how it works. So let's start with the developer's workflow. We want to sign an artifact. So the first thing we do is we request a certificate to Fulcio. And then we need to provide an OIDC token. So we have to authenticate with an OIDC provider. We authenticate, we get back a token, and then we pass this token to Fulcio. Fulcio will verify our identity based on this OIDC token. Um, it will issue a certificate that we can use for signing. It will give us back this certificate and it will also publish the certificate to the record transparency law. So now we are back here, we have our certificate, we sign the artifact and we publish the signed artifact. So our OCI registry, that's it. Our artifact is signed. So now let's see the other user story. We are an end user and we want to verify the signature. So we're here, end user. First thing we need to do is to find and download the artifacts from the registry. And then we need to query the record as privacy log. And we check the signature, we check the keys, we check the timestamp. And if we trust it, we say, okay, we have to check that the signing party is inside the sixth or trust group. And with that information, we can successfully verify the the signature. That's it. We don't need anything. We don't need a public key. We don't need uh, anything at all. So you don't need private key for signing. You don't need public key for verifying. And then for monitors, that's even easier. I mean, everything is stored in the record transparency log. Um, remember, we mentioned that record is an immutable ledger of metadata. No one can modify or delete any uh, 16 record. So everything is there, it cannot be modified. So it's perfect for monitor just to look into this query. It also has some RESTful API, CLI, so you can easily query the transparency log. Okay, so this is how the keyless uh, workflow works. Let's see an example. Let's see how we can sign with keyless. Again, same as before, let's try to sign the, the same container image. Now we're going to sign the other, the other version, the other tag, sorry, the version 0 0.2.0. We need to mark it. We need to pass this environment variable, the cosine experimental, because at this moment it's still experimental. Okay, and now what happened is my browser opened this. And it's asking me to log in using one of these OIDC providers. For this demo, I will use a GitHub. So I click on GitHub and that's it. Authentication was successful. We can now close this. And if we go back, successfully verify the token and it created a transparency log entry with this index. We could use this index to query record using the record CLI and we will see the entry there. And um, also, it has pushed the signature to the registry. Let's check that. Same as before, the signature is here. This was the, the first example with a keeper, and now we have the killers here, which is this tag, this is the digest, and this is the name. As you can see, it matches. So this is how you sign with killers. And as you have seen, there is no keys. I don't have to store any keeper, any private key, any password. And let's see how we can verify an image. That's it. We don't need anything, any public key or anything at all. This is saying that the cosine is verifying the, it's checking 
the record transparency law for the signature uh, um, for the certificate. He said, that, okay, it, it was successful. Um, this was the issuer and the subject that came from the OIDC provider. So here we can say, okay, it was GitHub, the provider, and this is the email address. I trust this email address, so I can trust this signature. That's how you verify using the keyless workflow. Okay, this is great, but it still requires some human interaction. As you can see, I typed cosine sign with the experimental flag on my terminal and it opened a browser and I had to manually go there, which is not great for a real environment because I'm pretty sure you are all using some build pipelines, CI CD pipelines. You, uh, cosine has support for that. You can directly pass the token using the identity token flag to cosign. And if you have a GitHub, if you're using GitHub Action or Google Cloud, they have automatic discovery, which means that if you're running inside uh, one of these environments, cosign is uh, smart enough to detect that you're running inside uh, of one of them. It will fetch the OIDC token for you and it will pass it to Fuchu. So everything happens transparent to the end user. Let's see how we can do that with GitHub Action. Again, let me go back to the example that I created. Bring it here. Um, this is the workflow I created. This is saying, okay, every time you push a tag that start with a V, run this job. We're giving permission to publish a package, which is important because we need to, to publish the, the signature and also the, the container image as well. And the ID token, that's also very important. This is the permission for, for the OIDC token because we need to fetch an OIDC token from GitHub. Then these are standard, login to GitHub to retrieve the tag name, we're building the, the image. Here is where Sisto comes in. We are installing Sisto and then we are signing. As you have seen here, we just need to pass the vari environment variable, the experimental one, and that's it, and sign. There is no key again, there is nothing at all. There is not even a call to OIDC, and that's because Cosign will detect that we are running inside of a workflow, GitHub Action workflow, and it will fetch the OIDC token for us. So everything happens automatically. That's really cool. It's nothing to be done. So let's see how it work, how this works. Yeah, I run it. Let's see this workflow. Let's go to the course. Okay, this is the installer and this is the signature. Okay, same as before. Created a transparency log entry. Again, we could query that if we wanted to the record transparency log. Cosign verify will do this for you. And it push the signature again to, to the same registry. So that's it. That's how you integrate with uh, GitHub Action in a CI pipeline. That's really cool that everything happens automatically. So let's uh, recap. We have learned how to sign container images with Cosign. You can use the Keeper uh, workflow, but again, you need to handle the private key, you need to keep the password secure, and you need to distribute the public key for verification. Or you can use the keyless mode, as we have seen, which is still experimental, but hopefully will not be experimental soon. And by the way, Kubernetes is using the keyless. It's just really cool because you don't need to, to handle any keys and you don't need to, to distribute a public keys for verification. Then you can verify content images. We have seen how you can verify images in the CLI, but okay. You're not gonna manually verify images. You want to do that inside your Kubernetes cluster or just before you deploy a pod in your Kubernetes cluster. So how can you do that? Well, you have to do that with a dynamic admission control. Um, for that, I will hand over to Victor who will explain how dynamic admission control works. Many thanks, Raul. So as my colleague Raul was saying, Let's see how dynamic admission control works in Kubernetes. In this slide, we have a diagram of a Kubernetes cluster. In the left side, we have our happy user, or maybe the tooling no, that is hitting the cluster, CI, CD, things like that. Um, in the middle, the big blue box, 
is the API server. And we can see that it has four distinct phases in this case. The first one is authentication and authorization, where we authenticate that the user is who they say that they are, and then we see if they are authorized to perform the request that they want to perform. The request meaning, let's say that the user wants to create a pod. In the second phase, we have the mutating admission, and there Kubernetes exposes us some webhooks where we can just uh, connect and run our own logic. In this case, we, we maybe want to mutate the, the request. Let's say that we get a pod and we want to change what is inside of the pod. We do it, and then we go to the next phase, which is the schema validation, where we validate that the request, which is a JSON, matches the schema. In this case, matches the, the spec of the, of the pod, for example, no? a pod spec. If that goes correct, we go to the next phase, and last one, which is validating admission. And here we check for whatever we want, because we can run, again, our own logic provided by, the, by connecting to those webhooks, and then we provide a binary response. Either we are validating or not validating. If everything goes fine, then we validate, and the things get persisted to ATCD, which will get picked up by the, by the reconcilers of the, of the cluster, and things will get created or deleted or whatever we want. So let's see it with a specific, a specific example. No? Let's say that we want to um, change all pods that go into the cluster. So they contain an annotation, and that annotation contains the string prod. Okay. Then as a user, we just do a cube control apply of a pod, and that's a YAML that is just JSON no? in, in the request. We go through authentication and authorization to see if we can, if we are authenticated and if we can, uh, if we are authorized by airbag to create that pod. Perfect. We then we go to mutation. Here we run our own logic, and we just add the annotation prod into the the JSON of the of the pod. Pretty simple. Which after afterwards we go to schema validation where we get the JSON of the pod with our annotation prod inside. We check that the, the JSON matches the pod uh, spec, perfect, and then we go to validating admission, where we run again our own logic again, no? and we check if that pod contains the annotation prod. In this case, it contains it, because we have added it in the mutating phase. So we validate, perfect. It goes to ATCD, gets persisted, and gets uh, reconciled and created by the rest of the cluster. Perfect. So with this explain, now we can use this, this mechanism to change and, and validate things happening in the cluster. And with that, we can use a policy engine to secure our cluster with Sixter and so on. How does that work? Well, let's see a specific example. In this case, we have selected Cubewarden, which is a CNCF project. And it's a policy engine that our uh, colleagues and I are working on. And so it's fairly, um, we are fairly used to it. It also has some properties that are uh, great for this case, for this case of Sixtor. Let's see, let's see which ones are they. As a normal policy engine, no, it's going to monitor and enforce policies in the cluster and and validate the or mutate the requests. It's installed via Helm charts. It provides uh, three CRDs, the policy server, to run the policies, and then you have two policies: either cluster admission policies, cluster wide, or admission policies, namespace. The policy server and libraries are written in Rust, which for us meant that we needed to improve the uh, uh, Sixtor's Rust libraries. And there was no Sixtor Rust crate, so we created one and we donated it to, to Sixtor upstream, and it has taken a life of its own, and we are super happy with that. And one thing that is important and relevant for us is that policies are WASM modules. So all languages no, that can compile to WASM can be used to write the policy and be, and be run as a policy in the cluster. And why is that important? Let's see why is that, that important. So what are the benefits for us no? If about WebAssembly? For those that don't know about WebAssembly, it's a, it's a binary instruction format. It provides a common target architecture no? for several uh, languages. And it's very small. Once you compile it, the binaries for us, in this case, are going to be super small. The policies are 1 megabyte, 2 megabytes, 3 megabytes big, which is quite small which means that it's fast, no? in that sense, pulling and pushing policies. It's polyglot, so every language that compiles to Rust, uh, sorry, to Wasm is useful for us, and more uh, languages are added every day, and we have, for example, Rust, Go, Swift, uh, TypeScript, and Rigo policies and OPA policies can also be compiled to Wasm, which 
uh, runs uh, allows us to run policies already written for other policy engines, which is great. Uh, in this case, Wasm is secure. Uh, it's Wasm is run in a sandbo sandbox uh, runtime that is isolated. So the apps cannot ex escape the sandbox without going through this define APIs. And this comes from the from the web um, the world, no? Because that's where Wasm was created. So these APIs are pretty defined and, and pretty secure. It has memory safety, it has control flow integrity, uh, protected call stacks, a lot of things no? that, that are nice to us. No buffer overflows, so it's pretty secure. It interfaces the, the, the host with, uh, we interface the host with POSIX like uh, interface in this case. Uh, we use WASI, so it's kind of like a POSIX like system interface for all the, all the things needed by the, by the policy. And it's quite uh, portable. You just need to compile it once and run it wherever you want. This means, uh, all of this now means um, that it's nice, this is a bit off topic, but it's nice because it kind of like removes layers in a way. You just compile it once and there's a lot of things that you can take out. So if you, in any moment, you wanted to um, simplify the stack in general, maybe Wasm is something to have uh, an eye on. Okay, with all that said, what are the benefits for us in the policy world? Well, maybe you are used already no, to, to write things in Go and you know your Go and so on. Then you can keep using it for, for writing your policies. Just use Go, use your favorite libraries, your um, favorite tooling, linters and so on. Maybe you don't need to change how you work. You use Git, you use your CI CD that you already have and so on, which is great. And apart from that, Wasm modules, the Wasm binaries, are uh, are in OCR registries with first class support, so the same level the same level as container images in registries or Helm charts in OCR registries. Wasm modules are uh, there in OCI registries, which is great as we will see in the future. And also thanks to this, we can run the policies outside of the cluster. We can iterate on the policies and we can iterate on the on the signatures and so on outside of the cluster. And once we are done, we go to the cluster. Okay, back to Sixtor. How do we sign and verify a policy, no? Well, we are saying that policies, WASM modules, have first class support in OCI registries, same as container images, and same as container images. My colleague Raul has explained how to do uh, sign signing and verifying of container images with cosign, so the same is, is true for, for keyword and policies. We just do cosign sign, cosign verify. We can see here an example of cosine, uh, cosine verify. It's a keyless one, provides an easier and subject, pretty simple. Of course, uh, you can do it locally, and we provide also the tool in KWCTL, which allows us to verify the policy locally, for example, for signatures, or run the policy locally, or pull it locally, and so on, which is pretty nice. Okay, How do, where do we find policies? Well, you can find them in, hub, in the hub that Qwarden has, which is hub.qwarden.io, where you can see also if the signatures, if the policies are signed or not via Sixtor. But Qwarden uh, is a CNCF project, which means that we are present in artifacthub.io. So if you go to artifacthub.io, you look for the kind uh, Qwarden policies, and all the policies that have been submitted there will be listed. Those policies that have been signed with Sixtor have the, the little tick there, as you can see in the screenshot, signed. So that's great. Many thanks for the, to the artifact hub for, for this feature. Okay, so now we know about keyboard and policies. We know that they are WASM modules. How do we secure the cluster with Sixtor and, and keyword and policies? We have to do two things, no? We have first to trust the policies. And once we have trusted the policies, we deploy one policy that secures the cluster. How do we ensure that all policies are trusted then? We just configure the policy server with the settings that we want. Here we have the example. The policy server has a field verification config in the spec, and it needs to point to a config map that contains the, the verification config. That verification config, you can obtain the default by using KWCTL scaffold, as you can see here, and it's pretty simple. You can see that it has all of and any of no? in, the, in, in the config. 
all of is an array of all the things that all the signatures that need to be present. And in this case, we only have the, the one for Q portion. So we're talking about policies. We want all the things that are, uh, all, we want everything to be signed via GitHub Actions workflows and the owner Q warden, the repo Q warden. That's it. Why are we not listing here the issuer and subject and so on? Well, this is part of the best practices no, that one should um, use. And the thing is, um, the, um, the certificates, the OICD certificates from, from GitHub for workflows and, and so on, provide issuer and subject, but there could be a problem where you, if you use reusable workflows, an attacker could reuse your workflow and pretend that it's signing as you. For that, that's as, uh, by design because GitHub, uh, GitHub provides another extension in the, in the certificate that lists which specific job was run for signing. And that's the one that we also need to look. And we in QWorden have implemented it, so we are looking for that specific um, X502 certificate extension. So we are checking for what we need to check. So if we were to, to configure the policy server with this, we will be asking for all the policies to be signed and that signature being performed in, a, in GitHub Actions and being performed from a job that has run inside of the keyboard and org. It's an array. You could add your own. No? Maybe you have your own policies. Maybe you are resigning your policies. Um, they come from your own um, CI and so on. You could just fill here what you need to fill. Once we are that, we, we have that, we are ensuring that our policies that are going to be deployed are trusted. And now we need to ensure that all images, no, container images in the cluster are trusted. How do we achieve that? We can use a policy. In this case, we are using this verify image signatures policy from Artifact Hub. This is a policy that we have written, the keyword and team. You could write your own. We provide um, SDKs no, for several languages, so you could just write your own. But if you want to use this one, then um, we can just go with this one. In this case, it's written in Rust. It's 200 lines of Rust, just checking the JSON, no, a bit if things are there, and then pulling the the the, the signatures and checking if the signatures are signed by the people that you want to be signed, and that's it. It's 200 lines of Rust, 400 lines of unit tests, and a bit more for end-to-end -end tests, and that's it. Not much. How do we deploy this policy in the cluster? We do it by instantiating a cluster admission policy. We can see one here. We can do a, a cluster admission policy where we set the spec.module to the WASM module of these verify image signatures, as we can see here, and then we have the rules. In the rules, we can see that we are uh, checking this policy is going to run every time that a pod gets created or updated. So every time that a request is going to try to change the spec of a pod, no? create or update. Then you can see that it says mutating true, which is going to, we're going to see why that is important. And then we have the settings of this policy. They are pretty similar as, as before. Here we are checking that all images that come from the GitHub container registry go releaser namespace are, are signed with a GitHub Actions workflow that was run from inside the Go Releaser organization. And we are also checking that all the images that come from the GitHub Container Registry namespace cube warden are signed via a GitHub Actions uh, workflow that has been run inside of the cube warden organization. Pretty simple. How do we? How does the policy work? How does the policy check with these settings? Well, let's see. The policy works like this. We have the JSON request on the left, which is for a pod, and then the policy logic runs. The policy is going to check the pod for all the containers inside of the pod. So in this case, container images, init containers, ephemeral containers. Then for those, it's going to check if they are signed. And if they are signed, they're going to check. It's going to check if the signature matches what we have listed as trusted. And if not, we reject the pod. And if it's signed and signed by the people that we want it to be signed, we can approve. Perfect. But ah, normally no one in the pod, in the container image, 
we, we list the, the URL for the container and the tag. But the tags are mutable. We maybe have go releaser 1.0, but maybe it's signed, but one can just push another go releaser 1.0 overwriting it because it's mutable. So that's not enough because an attacker could just in the future change the, the tag, the, 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 what the tag points to. So what we should do is mutate the, the pod and we append the checksum digest of the image after the, the tag. And that way we are pinning exactly the tag with the checksum digest of the image and nothing can be changed. And then we can approve and that's it. So to apply the policy, we just do kubectl apply of the policy that we have been uh, we have seen before. And then you can see that it's, uh, it's gonna take a bit, a minute. And then we can see, for example, in this kubectl get uh, cluster emission policies that the status is active at the end to the right. With that, the, po the policy is enforcing and is protecting, perfect. You could also use uh, uh, the condition no, of the of the custom resource. In this case, we would be waiting the, for condition policy active, and when, once it's done, we know that it's enforcing. Okay, let's see how that looks. So let's try to instantiate the pod with an untrusted image. Maybe this pod is signed, maybe it's not signed, but it's signed by somebody, maybe it's signed, maybe it's not signed, or it's signed by somebody that we don't trust. So here we have a pod, it's an Nginx pod, it's not signed, and we can see we try to instantiate it and uh, it doesn't work. We say we see that pod, pod Nginx is not accepted. Verification of image Nginx failed. No signatures found for image. Perfect, that's what we wanted. What happens if we try to instantiate a pod with trusted images? In this case, the Go Releaser, no? Go Releaser was signed via GitHub Actions workflow, and this particular version is signed, so we just run it, the policy checks it, perfect. And we can see that it has mutated the, the pod. Once it has been instantiated, if we do the kubectl get pods go releaser and we look for the container image, the container image not only has the tag, but it has the checksum digest appended at the end. Perfect, that's what we wanted. Okay, with this, making sure that the, the policies are signed, are trusted, and everything, every workload re resource, every pod, uh, container image, um, jobs, uh, replica sets and everything are secure in the cluster, we are done. What's next? Okay, my colleague Raul no, and I have talked about how to secure uh, with Sixtor uh, the cluster, but we have mainly focused on the leaves. No, we have mainly focused on, on, on our own workload resources. But normally you depend on other things. And we have not talked about those things. How do you solve that problem? Well, that is solved using software bill of materials, where we just list the dependencies no, of everything. And for those dependencies, you would run similar checks that we have run. But this uh, topic is a bit complex. It falls out of this uh, specific talk, and we look forward to talk about it in the future. Talking about dependencies, everybody depends on something, no? So if you have a, if you take something from this talk, if you take one thing, is to sign and verify everything. If you can, this is a, a community effort. We should be we should be able to to just sign and verify everything that we that we create and use. And in specific for Cuborden, what's next for us is apart from other things in this topic is uh, in the sixth other topic is expanding the CI integration. We have shown how to how how one can use public keys, how can use GitHub Actions, no, for for uh, for signing and verifying and so on. But what happens from other um, CI providers? For those, one needs um, specific uh, best practices for their certificates and so on, and we look forward to to adding those in in Qwarden. And talking about Qwarden, maybe you are now interested in it or maybe you want to talk uh, to us about Sixtor in general. So please come, come to us in the, in the Qwarden Slack, in the Kubernetes workspace, or hit us in the GitHub organization Qwarden. And if you're interested in, in seeing the Qwarden policies and so on, go to qwarden.io or Artifact Hub and, and have a look. And don't forget to, to talk to us on Twitter if you, if you feel like there's something that you would be interested on. And with that said, Many thanks for your time. We hope that you have learned something and enjoyed the, the talk and see you around.